My name is Jamie Haverill. I'm the executive director for the Iowa Healthy Estate Initiative and also serve as one of the uh, tri-chairs for the Capital Crossroads Wellness Capital. And so we're thrilled to have everyone here today and to have the amazing panelists joining us to help us talk about um, Make It Okay during this COVID situation. So Make It Okay is a community campaign that is working to reduce the stigma of mental illness across the state of Iowa. And we've partnered with Capital Crossroads to help bring that message to here to Central Iowa. Iowa. Make It Okay is sponsored by a number of great organizations that you see listed here and this work would not be possible without their ongoing support to make this, pro make this campaign available. We also have a number of community partners that have helped us bring together the six weeks of Make It Okay and so I want to do a shout out to Capital Crossroads and Emily for all of her work and Meg at the Greater Des Moines Partnership. Additionally, we've continued to partner with the Business Publications Corporation on their Lifting the Veil series and Life Interrupted, which many of you have probably participated in and appreciate their partnership in helping us spread the word about Make It Okay. Said who I was, so we're gonna jump into uh, who really matters here. Um, I'm excited to have a great group of panelists that are representative of our community to help share with us on Make It Okay during COVID um, for the next hour. It will probably go pretty fast. So we're just gonna jump right in and instead of me introducing each of our panelists, I'm gonna have them introduce themselves. So I'd like to start with Dr. Patrick. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, what does life look like for you lately and how have these last six months impacted you, you personally or professionally? So if you could just jump in with us. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon now. Uh, my name is Lauren Patrick. I am a dentist at University Dental Group, which is located in the Drake neighborhood. I practice with two other uh, dentists and I'm also a wife and a mom of a 15 month old. So kind of juggling a mixture of home life, business and uh, seeing patients. And I think first and foremost, um, we all see our, our families as our priority. Um, and so home life looks a little bit different in that um, our number one priority, my husband and I is making sure that uh, our daughter's life continues to be happy and fulfilled. Um, and that means, you know, making sure that um, we are adapting our mental health um, so that we aren't bringing you know, negativity into her world necessarily. Um, the other piece then is business. And um, as a provider, it's really important for me uh, to keep my staff feeling safe first and foremost. And like they have a safe space to um, talk and also safe as in PPE and all of the guidelines that have gone into place in dental practices. And as well as patients and making sure that patients feel like our office is a safe space so that they can continue to have their treatment done and meet their treatment needs without uh, jeopardizing their health. So lots of adjustments. Um, fortunately in dentistry, we've already worn PPE and so there are a few additions to that. Um, again, in the medical profession, we're already used to wiping things down and clearing aerosols, but um, socially, I think that looks a little different as far as our interaction with patients and face-to-face um, -face is not as big of a, of a interaction as there was before, but certainly uh, the adjustments have been making sure our pictures are updated on our websites and uh, having follow-up conversations, whether that's over the phone or over Zoom, over Zoom with patients. So uh, there's a lot probably to dive into here, but uh, that's a brief intro. So thank you for having me. Hey, Dr. Shaw, do you want to jump in and introduce yourself and kind of talk about how things have changed for you too? Sure, Jamie. Yes. Uh, hello, all. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Shaw. I'm a chief medical officer at Broadlands Medical Center here in uh, Polk County. I'm also a geriatrician and uh, started uh, four years ago at Broadlands in geriatrics to mainly focus on dementia world, dementia prevention world. And in January of this year, became the chief medical officer. Uh, and my, one of my first meeting uh, in January, February was about the coronavirus. That time there was no COVID term yet, but having traveled around the world uh, as a Dean of Global Health, prior to joining Broadlands, uh, I had known about 
pandemics and talked about uh, infections uh, moving from one country to another, like Zika and Chikungunya and many others. So we started talking about that. And then, of course, COVID uh, hit us on uh, March, March 1st, March, uh, and then have been very busy about COVID and COVID preparation and how we deal with that as at a hospital level. And as Dr. Patrick, you mentioned, it's multifactorial. It's taking care of our own staff, taking care of our patients, uh, both physically and emotionally, and just in the so political and the social side of it. So I have been very busy, but what I tell my team, which is I, I genuinely believe, uh, yeah, we don't need any pandemic to change and find out our strengths, but at least COVID has shown me uh, the, the teamwork, what broad lawns, and not just broad lawns, because of COVID, we uh, in Polk County, at least, all the hospital CMOs have come together uh, chief medical officers have come together and we work very closely on initially COVID related issues, but now even non COVID related issues. So uh, it has brought uh, us internally and externally as a community together. And it has helped us to focus more on the topic of my passion, the social determinants of health. Uh, related to COVID, so it's been a it's been a hard work, tough journey, but it's it's uh, fulfilling in some ways. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Destiny, you want to jump in and introduce yourself? Oh, well, certainly. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining uh, us on this panel and asking brilliant questions. At the end, we're going to speak that into existence. Uh, I work for the uh, Iowa Department of Public Health as the Zero Suicide Project Evaluator. Um, so this zero suicide is a suicide safer care uh, framework that went from national to international, um, uh, you know, in a, in a, within a couple of years. And so uh, my job is to work with our integrated provider network. So folks who are the organizations who are funded uh, through Iowa Department of Public Health, there are about 20 of them, uh, brought along to me one. Uh, but there are... Um, unique challenges in this work <laughs> with the impact of COVID-19. And as an evaluator, uh, my, my world is, is shattering <laughs> in little pieces and trying to keep the project on, on track when uh, working with the people behind the processes. Uh, and, and so that's my main focus is to make sure that uh, the people are reflected in processes and people are able to breathe. Um, so when, you know, working with the, the integrated provider network, the 20 healthcare organizations that we have under our purview, um, a lot of it has been trying to be supportive in, in that, uh, at the state. So, you know, when, and a lot of people think about the state and think about the, <laughs> the slowness and the bureaucracy of it all. That's very much true. The other side of it is, uh, just being able to find the, um, uh, the spaces to be able to support uh, not only at the state level, uh, but being in the uh, pre-COVID. Yes, so <laughs> suicide stats. So in February of uh, this year, we actually lost 63 folks due to suicide. That was the highest month that we had as a course of this year. Uh, so thank you for that question. It's been going down to around 40 and, and 30 in the month. We still get data numbers. Um, coming in, we get weekly updated reports for that. Um, but personally, I just moved to the Drake area. So uh, my wife and I are first time home buyers. So there's that. Uh, we're, we're neighborly folks. So already folks will see us out on our porch and uh, little kids will stop by. And I'm like, oh, what are these little kids doing here? But this porch is a kid magnet. So uh, they will stop by and we didn't have not a toy in sight. So in, 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 in balancing my uh, professional life and trying to be supportive. I'm also trying to figure out what that means for uh, the, the Drake community. So also since block party might look like. So working with the Drake Neighborhood Association uh, to figure out um, what's going on in that. Awesome. So yeah. Thanks. We'll dig into more some of those uh, conversations I'm sure too. Uh, Liz, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Liz Cox. I'm the Executive Director of Polk County Health Services. We are um, 
really the administrators of the mental health and disability services region. So our responsibility is to ensure that there is access to mental health services across the county. Um, and uh, professionally, um, since March, life has taken uh, quite a turn. Um, mental health in our agency was side by side in the emergency operations center from the very beginning. Um, which is unique. I, I don't know of any other emergency operations centers that included mental health as a partner. And it turned out to be a, a really positive thing. One of the first things we did was put resources in place to support our first responders as they had really difficult conversations with their families about what would happen if they needed to quarantine or isolate or became uh, COVID positive. Another resource we put in place uh, for first responders was um, basically um, a caregiver fatigue assessment, in other words, a burnout assessment, um, and made sure that that was widely disseminated, not only among first providers, but also within our medical community as they were the first wave to take on many of the stresses and anxieties of our system. Um, since then, we have put a lot of resources out into the public uh, through our website, through the Polk County Health Department website, and have been a collaborative partner with schools and businesses as they put their return to learn and return to work plans together. You might know that schools are required to have social emotional supports for students and staff in their return to learn plans. So we are quite busy partnering with the schools here within the metro area. Um, since that time, we've continued to be a partner. Um, to those schools as they have started to welcome kids back into their classrooms and wanting to make sure that they have um, access to the support and resources they need for families and also staff. Um, Andrew, I, I like the question earlier about suicide rates. Uh, we have been monitoring suicide and overdose rates here in the metro from the very beginning. Um, we're thankful to say that our suicide rates have not changed. Uh, however, our suicide rates are high. So um, they've been steady but high here in Polk County. Our overdose rates um, kind of have fluctuated. We've seen a dramatic increase in the number of phone calls to uh, resource centers like the Broadlawn Center, but also Your Life Iowa. We worked really hard at the beginning to make it easy for people to connect with mental health resources. So we worked with 211 and Your Life Iowa and 211 added extension eight so you just punch extension eight, you don't have to listen to anything else and you get directly connected with uh, a counselor or a therapist through Your Life Iowa. And uh, luckily we've been able to monitor those uh, reports and our community is using that resource, which is really great. I think one of the challenges that we continue to face is a phone call is a phone call and a lot of us need uh, more than just a phone call for mental health supports. And that pipeline of getting people connected to therapists and counselors still um, is, is a challenge. It's a little bit of a wait. We're also really happy to see um, the Unity Point team put together a mental health walk-in clinic um, specifically for COVID uh, up by Lutheran Hospital. And uh, of course, they did that in partnership with um, Irely Ball and uh, Orchard Place, so um, a really valuable resource in our community and we're part, really happy to see that partnership happen. Uh, we continue to be part of the Emergency Operations Center function as we plan for our recovery out of COVID and bringing forward the concept in term of resilience and what does that mean and how do we uh, really practice the skills that bring this level of resilience forward. Uh, on a personal level, um, I am also president of the Western Wayne School Board. So uh, that has brought unique challenges um, and a lot of leadership development opportunities, um, but really proud that our district has been in partnership with our community, our parents and our teachers in supporting uh, kids coming back into our classrooms. I think the happiest thing that I've heard is a parent emailing me saying, the, talking about the joy that her child had in returning to school and how that joy was brought back into the home. And we all know that emotions are as contagious as the common cold. So when kids come home happy, you know, it impacts everybody. Uh, so um, we are very concerned, though, about the long term uh, impact of this ongoing uh, mental health crisis that we're in. Almost 40% of Iowans have reported anxiety and or depression. And uh, that's significantly higher than it was a year ago. Uh, the national trend a year ago is about 11%. So we all know that when we're, we have extended, prolonged anxiety or depression, it can leave actually lasting physical health uh, impacts as well. So 
we were a little concerned about that and really trying to get the resources in place for people um, to support their mental health along with their physical health. Thanks, Liz. I think that kind of leads into really the next discussion. You know, Liz kind of hit on how we're starting to see the impact. So maybe each of you can talk about how you've seen your own mental health, your workplace's mental health, the community or the people that you serve, the impact that this uh, pandemic has had on their mental health and kind of the concerns for the future as well. Who wants to jump in? Dr. Shaw, you're on mute. Can, I can start because uh, being in the healthcare field and uh, being here at, uh, let me give you an example of what happened here at, uh, in Broadlawns and with many nurses and staff, but all over the hospital area, I talked to some of the CEMOs. So initially, since COVID was so new, we didn't know how it was spreading and, and the positive patients who were admitted in ICU the non-ICU staff or no other staff would be even hesitant to help the ICU nurses or, or do simple things with them. And they initially, in the first week or so, the nurses uh, in ICU felt almost like they were getting isolated because they were treating patients with COVID. And some of that affected their even home life and family life. So it was very stressful in the beginning and but over time as we have learned now we can learn how to live with the, taking care of patients with covid also so it, it was it was very stressful in the beginning same thing applied at home my dad is 85 lives in new york and starting from march on he would call me right at seven uh, our time just asking simple COVID questions. Oh, how are things in uh, in Iowa? In New York, numbers are going up, and how are your numbers? And after a few days of regular call, it got tiring for me. So, Dad, either we don't talk at seven, or you call but don't talk about COVID numbers. So, so I, but things, of course, got better. So, a lot, lot of things we learned uh, in the beginning at how how we got stressful, but things that we can now cope and manage well. I would echo what Dr. Shaw is talking about in terms of family. Uh, when COVID first um, came to the world, my son was studying abroad in Florence, actually, the kind of this, the second epicenter of uh, the outbreak. And uh, so his study abroad was uh, abruptly, you know, deleted, you know, terminated. Um, but I also um, had a daughter who was a senior in college and um, and I'm sure anybody that has kids that were seniors in high school or seniors in college or going through any kind of, um, you know, landmark event, um, know what I'm talking about when um, they just felt cheated. They felt cheated out of what everybody else had. They didn't get their normal high school graduation. They didn't get their normal senior prom. They, you know, they just lost out on so much. And, and the same was true for seniors in college. So. As me personally, I think a lot of my energy was invested in supporting my own kids' mental health. And we had a lot of conversations about being okay with sadness and grief. And there was so much of that as um, COVID uh, rolled across America. And my daughter, who was a senior in college, was in Boston, where they had very strict guidelines. Like you did not leave your home without a mask. And there were certain times you could go to the grocery. I mean, it was really restrictive. And then she came home, you know, at the end of the school year, and she really had some culture shock because, of course, we didn't have the same mask mandates and her brother was out golfing and, you know, what are you doing golfing? I've been locked in my apartment for four months. So um, there's been a roller coaster here uh, on a personal level with my family. I would say professionally, uh, our team has, similar to Dr. Shaw, has really been pushed to uh, understand how do we work differently and support our mental health community in a way that they um, have never been supported before. Our goal initially was to make sure that people had access to their mental health supports. We did everything we could to put cell phones in the hands of folks and we're so thankful to have telemedicine, but there was still so many people that needed direct support. Um, we're still fairly concerned about those, um, you know, people that are hoarders, for instance, and things like that, that we just, we're just not going into their homes anymore. Um, our goals were to keep people as stable as possible and connected to their resources as best that we could so they wouldn't end up in the emergency room or needing a mental health bed or in jail as those systems were working to reduce their populations. We also wanted to make sure people could maintain their housing. Um, you know, 
the eviction restrictions were only for people that had a one-year lease. A lot of people that we serve have monthly, month to month, and could have been evicted many times. So we were advocating uh, that those evictions didn't happen because we really didn't want a larger homeless population. So those were some of the stresses on our team. And I think uh, those low stresses have kind of um, leveled out a little bit, but we still do have quite a bit of concern of how do we come out of COVID and how do those supports get put back in place? A lot of people with disabilities that had jobs, those jobs don't exist anymore or uh, they got laid off. So um, we're expecting a little bit of a bounce there when we start quote returning to normal. Yeah, Liz, that's an excellent point. Uh, personally, in, in adjusting to um, COVID, it, it has been a lot going on for me. <laughs> I serve on several different boards and councils, uh, one of which is the Iowa Queer Community Color Coalition. Um, so even thinking about how um, Black and Brown LGBTQ people in Iowa are doing, and, and we also work with those who, who recently immigrated here or, or in the process of migrating. So um, being able to share info out, you know, through personal channels has been helpful. Uh, personally, it really did um, do a number on me. We were also looking at buying a house at that point in time. So the Ides of March was when we decided we liked our house. <laughs> we closed on April 15. So in the height of everything and all the, the mayhem and people starting to grasp what COVID-19 meant. Um, I'm working with trying to uh, make sure my grandmother has the most up-to-date information along with uh, some of the boards and councils that I serve on. Uh, professionally, you know, Department of Public Health has been very visible in what information we were able to put out. Um, it went from here's what information our team has at IDPH, giving it to the governor, <laughs> governor providing the updates, and it has just been a very visible process um, in, in, in terms of what information is out there. Uh, personally, me speaking as Destiny Woodruff, without all the titles, I, I wanted information to be out sooner. And so there was always uh, an internal war of, well, what can we give faster? Or what can we do to help uh, provide uh, more info to our providers? Um, faster? How can we open up the channels between us and the community? And, and, and so um, hopefully once this pandemic is, we're finally at a, not necessarily a ceasefire, because I don't know when it's coming, uh, to be able to have the open dialogue between the, the community and departments of public health, not even have to be state, but just thinking about that, I'm looking forward to that piece. I want to chime in uh, because I definitely can relate to the the professional aspects of how COVID has impacted all of us over the last few months. But um, as a dentist that works in private practice, I, and you guys might hear my, uh, my topic crying in the background, <laughs> um, I am not able to work from home. And so where people transition to um, shifting to their desk, I turned into a stay at home mom. And uh, professionally, I find myself to be fairly successful. I feel confident in my abilities in the workplace. But there is nothing like being at home with your child for 90 days straight with no relief um, to make you question your own mental state on a daily basis. Uh, I was, it was challenging to have my husband, who is an attorney, uh, and still required to bill hours and has some flexibility, but again, is trying to get work done and then become a single parent. And I definitely um, gained some perspective in, in that uh, realm of single parenting, but then um, just vulnerability in the sense of calling my midwife and saying, hey, I don't feel good. And um, in all other areas, I normally feel but like I've, I've got it together. I've got this education and I've, you know, financially can provide for myself, but, but this is different. And um, I've got people who are depending on me, particularly this little nugget um, who has no idea what's going on in the world. And I'm, I'm trying to do my best here. And so I, I just want to uh, speak to that because I think there's, there's a piece of home life that even with, with schools and, and Liz, I'm sure you have gone through a whole other realm of conversations around school and people's children. 
Um, but that's been a big stress, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, Dr. Patrick, I'm glad you mentioned that personal, uh, because those who cannot work from home, uh, it's, it's, I agree with you, I'm very difficult. I tried uh, as a CMO now, I can work for, I could have worked from home, but it's not same as your own space in your clinic or your, in your hospital there. You kind of, uh, you know your stuff well, you have somewhat control. There are people who can listen to you. For me at my home, I had my mother in, I have my mother-in-law, my wife and my, my daughter came back from uh, Georgetown and all, I had to listen to them all uh, one day and I said enough of working from home. So <laughs> I agree. Yeah, you guys all bring up great points. I think just recognizing that, you know, COVID has impacted every single Iowa and just maybe differently based on, you know, where we work or what our personal situation is, because I think each and every one of you have highlighted that we're all in different spaces, but none of us are immune of COVID and the mental toll it's taken on all of us. And for some of us, it's worse than others, right? And so as we also think about the long-term or even the short-term impact, I know Liz highlighted, you know, obviously the impact of mental health on physical health as well. So can we talk about maybe some of the, the resources or the coping mechanisms that you guys have adopted yourself um, during this last, you know, six to seven months? And maybe what are things that you're thinking about as we move into winter? I think that's a concern that a lot of people have is as we move into these shorter days, it's colder, we tend to hibernate in the state of Iowa anyway. Like, what are some of the opportunities, I guess, to reinforce the importance of staying mentally as well as physically active and some of those coping mechanisms? Uh, I'll go. I will say that, you know, moving in the midst of this pandemic, uh, the kids, neighborhood kids were a beautiful distraction. <laughs> Again, I didn't have a toy in sight, but now there's a two-tote system uh, that I have on my front porch and they know where to go. So I sanitize and, and keep it together. But um, had it not been for them saying, hey, can we can we throw the ball around? Can, can we draw? Can we color? And this and that. Like, it, they actively take me out of Oh God, I don't know when the end is. I don't know when the end is near as far as COVID, or I don't know when the vaccine is coming. They keep me engaged. I have to see them off every morning because I sit on my porch <laughs> during the workday. Usually, it's cold right now. Uh, but just those little breaks, I, I think it's important to, um, yeah, be outside and to be able to have those real conversations uh, with your friend group. Uh, whether it's via Zoom or, or Google and, and whatnot. Um, right now, I'm in the midst of trying to coordinate uh, almost like a podcast style uh, with Black LGBTQ individuals and just have a roundtable and, and talk about how we've been feeling in Iowa in, in the midst of not only COVID-19, but a lot of um, the spirit I will say acts that have occurred over the past, over this past year. So for me, it was bigger than George Floyd. When I cried for George Floyd, it was about Emmett Till. Uh, so, you know, thinking about how COVID-19 has forced us to be inside, but it's really allowed for, you know, us to have the opportunity to have self-reflection. And so having that space, I think is critical in making that space for yourself as a part of your daily regimen is important. That's saying that's very true. I think uh, it gave us, it gave me time for self reflection, both uh, on my life goals and also for physical goal and physical health. Uh, enough to not just do myself, which I do regularly, update my advanced directive, but also to think about succession planning and financial planning in detail. Because we saw, especially in the hospital, we saw. Uh, young and old people come uh, without uh, and then getting intubated. So yeah, it, 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 uh, Jamie, that's a, it brought different perspective of life in a very short, quick time, which could have taken longer time to realize. It condensed time for me very, very fast. Oh, I don't want to lose sight of Debbie's question. What's your reaction to the new guidelines in Iowa? related to not having to quarantine if you're exposed to COVID and both parties are wearing a mask. <clears throat> I'm a little leery. <laughs> Again, I don't speak for all of the Department of Public Health. I'm speaking for me. Uh, it, it does kind of make me sit back a little bit going, oh, well, because there's still so much we don't know. 
um, about how it, how it's really transmitted and you know how long it stays in the air. That's changing day to day. So with each pit, with each bit of information, I kind of tend to sit with it a little bit and digest it. Great question, Debbie. Uh, Jamie, there are a couple of is a, some communication on the chat about uh, this uh, new new requirements or new change of policy that if you have COVID, uh, but if you are wearing mask uh, and what to do. So what, what I might just broader suggestion would be that COVID positive test doesn't mean that I'm infectious. So, so meaning that there are different ways the COVID test uh, becomes positive and it's called, and I, I'm not going to technical part here, but it's called cyclic threshold meaning some tests can pick up very few viruses while some picks up many viruses. And just being positive doesn't mean uh, I'm infectious. So just to keep in mind uh, as the chat is going on. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Liz or Lauren, do you have any thoughts about like how you've been coping or what you're thinking about or recommendations as we move into our winter months of Iowa? Yeah, so, um... I took to um, daily outdoor activities. So um, really using our trails, walking and biking. When the kids were home, uh, we did some front yard badminton. And I think, you know, just tried to, to recreate outside as much as possible. Zoom fatigue was real. I was living it. Um, it's not uncommon to spend eight to 10 hours a day on Zoom for me. And uh, it, the insomnia came right along with it at the beginning of COVID, um, you know, the work hours were so long and you're just, you know, the brain just didn't have a chance to process everything. And so you go to bed, but you really weren't sleeping. So for me, as much out time, outside time as possible that I could get, I also took to letter writing. In fact, at my desk right here, I have like all these little, you know, note, note cards. And I started, um, you know, connecting with people in a different way than I had before. Anything to not have to be on the phone or on a Zoom. And so I thought a personal note would, would be a good idea. And so as a result, I've got some really cool pen pals now that reconnecting in a different way. Um, but in, as, as winter comes around, I'm from North Dakota, we don't stop going outside in the winter. So um, I'm ready to ride my fat bike and I've got my long underwear and, um, and all that. So that's not going to stop me uh, at all. And I, and I think Iowa has a lot to offer. I'm super excited about the water trails project that's already underway. There's so many people out on paddle boards and kayaks. And every time I'm on a trail, people are so friendly and happy, happier and friendlier than, than they've ever been before. There's so many more highs, hellos, how you doing, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, I really do um, think that, you know, staying connected to the outdoors, as Jamie knows, is, is really critical uh, in maintaining our, our well-being overall. Um, along with that, I would just say, you know, eating right um, it goes a long way, as we all know. So um, just kind of reiterating probably what everybody already knows, but actually doing it, that's a little hard. I don't have a, a ton to add to that, uh, except to say that we are so fortunate to have great parks and trails, um, particularly here in the Metro. And our family has really utilized this time to explore our local community. Neither of us are from Des Moines, we're transplants. Um, and so this has really allowed us to get outside and just uh, enjoy the space. And uh, Costco currently has uh, long underwear, as my dad always called it, uh, so that we can start to layer and continue to do those things. I'm also finding it important to, for myself to just get up before the rest of my home does and just have some personal quiet time. I think it's really easy to get into the day and all the things and all the masks and um, just finding some space. I think uh, Destiny mentioned that before for myself and a 4.30 alarm has just become that thing. And while that sounds quite torturous, uh, it has been my, my COVID ritual and it's working. So whatever it takes to adjust, I say. Yeah, I think you all bring great points. Of, I think routine is really important. I think, you know, for all of us, just having that routine and finding ways to stay active, especially as we do move into those colder months. I mean, unfortunately, Liz, we don't all have the same, um, you know, 
North, North Dakota genes, I guess, that, you know, embrace winter as much as our, our northern uh, friends do here in the United States, but hopefully we do have people taking advantage of those great parks and systems and recreational opportunities that really do exist right in our backyard that hopefully now this gives us the time to actually get out and use them um, and not forget that they're actually there to help us through many different uh, challenges in our life as well. So, and I think, you know, re reinforcing, you know, as Liz knows and all of you, I mean, obviously with Healthy Estate, that's part of it. How do we move more? How do we eat better? Um, so making sure that you're incorporating those into your everyday life. I've picked up on some new habits. I'm actually doing sourdough baking bread um, and have been gifting those to a lot of people. It's been fun to try new things. So I think it's kind of an opportunity to do some self-reflection and kind of find some new hobbies that will help take your mind off of whether it's work or just the unknowns that COVID and everything that's happening in our society is doing right now. So I always encourage people to try some new things. I picked up painting too, which I'm not very good at yet. So maybe by the end of 2020 or 2021, I'll be better. So let's move into our next question, I guess, about kind of what did the future of mental health look like for the community in a best case scenario? So where do we go from where we are today? What, what would you say is the best case scenario when it comes to mental health for our community? I probably want to start this one because we've got a nice long list of things that on our wish list um, for mental health in our community. Um, I think first of all is access. So one of the things that COVID revealed was there is no fear in telemedicine. Um, there was a a lot of debate up at the Capitol about whether or not telehealth was going to work and uh, turns out it works really well in mental health and people are showing up for their appointments on time and um, they're actually some anecdotal information from our providers is people are, are inclined to be a lot more open when they're sitting in their home as opposed to in their provider's office. So telemedicine works. Um, also uh, what was revealed is we need to have access in schools. So providing telemedicine access, teletherapy access uh, in school is critically important, and we would hope that that would continue. Uh, one of the other things that I think COVID revealed to us is a little bit of the fragility of the mental health system. Uh, while in Polk County, you know, we have a very strong system as compared to some other counties in our state, um, when the need is high, um, it is very hard to get connected. And when COVID came uh, into our community, um, the, the Crisis Observation Center and other mental health facilities sort of changed their protocols, screening people for COVID first before coming into the crisis center. Um, and at the beginning, a lot of people were staying home and not getting help. Um, that's not what's going on now. If our mental health beds are full again, and um, we know we're headed into the holiday time when mental health beds are quite often full again. So, um, you know, having more access to that inpatient support is, uh, I think, necessary for the long term well being. One of the best things that's come out of COVID is the reduction in the stigma. Everybody is realizing we all have anxiety, we all have depression or bits of it now and then, we're all struggling. And the more we talk about it, the more okay it is to talk about it and find a friend who, you know, can relate and offer support or make that phone call uh, and get an appointment with a licensed therapist. So uh, I think that is one of the very few silver linings in COVID is that the stigma of mental health, that bar has dropped and uh, we're excited to see so many people getting the help that they need. Agree, agree, Liz and uh, Jamie. So, what other thing uh, it has bro brought out, which is that the, our differences in our healthcare, both physical and mental healthcare, amongst our minorities and the, the widening of our communities, which didn't get the proper care they needed, they deserved prior to COVID, became even more prominent. So, the numbers, as we all know now the COVID percentage as well as the percentage of death, death not just in uh, Iowa, but nationally, internationally, uh, are much more higher in minorities, in African-Americans. And that, that got very, very open and clear about that. And so hopefully, my hopes are that in future post-COVID, we learn from what, what went right, what went wrong, and emphasize on mental health, emphasize on public health, and hopefully uh, reduce the social discriminations of health.
Destiny or Lauren, do you have thoughts? This question is a tough one to answer <laughs> for me. Um, as I've been thinking about it, uh, for the Department of Public Health, I serve on our uh, Health Equity Drivers Forum. And that group is comprised of 50 uh, our Department of Public Health employees that really work together to look at some of uh, the contractual language that we might have that might serve as a barrier uh, to, to, to treating those who live in Iowa, um, looking at our workplace discrimination policies, looking at how not only we feel, but how we process um, and what activities we actually do to promote um, an equitable institution. So, you know, thinking about that at the state level is tough, but ideally from that side of the house, um, it would be nice to have the open dialogue where we're actually comfortable to say, um, here's what's working or here's what we can build upon. So being able to go, hey, Liz, over there at Polk County Health, being able to have uh, help up, you know, county level uh, health providers and professionals come in and say, hey, here's what's working or here's what message isn't coming across. That to me would be ideal um, to be able to work with folks who are more um, hands-on and being able to work with Iowans at a, at a closer level than we ever will. Now, we contract out with uh, different agencies and things like that and try and equip them uh, to, to do the work. But ideally, if looking at it from the state, people should be able to reach out to us and, and let us know um, what, what's working. Um, so that's what it would look like for me at the state level. Now, personally, it would be nice if folks just knew walking around on the street, it's like, hey, do you know where you can go to get some, uh, to get some COVID-19 resources or to get some rental assistance? Or do you know, you know, just being able to, you know, talk to somebody on the street and them automatically know, that would be ideal for me. Because that means that we would have done our job in promoting not only those resources, uh, but having the access uh, to, to folks to get them. So professionally and personally, that's what I'd love to see. What I've seen uh, chair side, a lot of people, the, the joke is always that your dentist wants to talk to you while they have a bunch of stuff in your mouth, right? Um, but what I've seen chair side is patients wanting to be much more open about what's really going on with them. Um, and understanding that people are multifaceted. So I, I talked about my personal struggles as a mom, but also professionally. Um, and, and I think that the, what has come out of this, and I hope that what will continue is that we just are more empathetic to other people's struggles because we aren't all dealing with the same challenges as far as COVID is concerned, but we all know that we're being challenged in some way. And I think it's created this freedom, like Liz mentioned earlier, that you know the bar is much lower in regards to what mental health really looks like right now and people feeling like they can express that they're not okay. And chair side, I find that um, when I say, you know, hey, how, how have you been? How are you doing with all of this? Instead of people just casually brushing it off and saying, saying, okay, or I'm good. You know, people are taking the opportunity to express how they're really feeling, what they're really going through, how return to learn has gone, um, what their home life looks like, what work adjustments they've needed to make. And so I would say, I hope that that continues. Um, I also think that it's created COVID and talking about COVID has created a space to let's dialogue about other things that are happening in society. I see a question about race and politics coming up. Um, and I think that we're just in a, a space that um, I, I hope, and I hope I'm not being naive about this, that even if we maybe aren't on the same page that we can kind of dialogue, like I'm not okay and why, are you, why am I not okay? You know, I'm not okay because I'm isolated from my parents who are old and we don't want them to uh, be sick, but I'm not okay because of, you know, race contentions and, and me having to deal with the workplace. So um, I hope that that continues, that empathy, and maybe it allows for conversations and, and solutions, real solutions going forward. One thing I would just add that is kind of a curiosity to me is when we do start convening again, how we're going to feel about that. Um, when can we hug each other or shake each other's hand or 
you know, and how, just how are we going to feel when we go back to work? Uh, our schools are in the process of that, you know, learning curve right now. Um, I, it's just curious to me what, what our, uh, you know, emotional response will be when, when we do have vaccinations and, and people kind of resume their new normal. Yeah, no, I think there'll be a lot of post-COVID, uh, not just physical, uh, uh, but you'll also learn about um, our mental health post-COVID. I, I was, I have a neighborhood, a newborn kid, uh, now now one year, and I worry what would happen to these new t toddlers and infants who don't get to hug people or, or strangers can't just touch them anymore. What would happen when that kid becomes five years and 10 years and what would happen to the social distancing concept? Hopefully we can go back after two, three years to not needing the social distancing, but they would not know the difference. I'm laughing because I already said, oh, go ahead, Lauren. Um, as, a, as a new parent, it's something that I definitely uh, struggle with, but I will say uh, she still recognizes other kids, even though she's isolated from them. She still uh, is very thrilled to be at a park with slides. And, um, you know, she's very interested in people. And so my hope and one thing we've had to talk to our pediatrician about is, you know, what are things that we can do? But one thing they constantly try to encourage us about is just that kids are resilient. And sometimes our kids are the bigger lesson to us in regards to um, just just pushing through it and and they're flexible and frankly it's something that I've I've chosen to compartmentalize because what can I do besides try to keep her safe okay so I think we'll we're getting close to the end of our hour so I want to just uh, pop in and see if there's some questions I know that we have one question from Sharla and so I'll just pose this to the group and see if anyone wants to help address, but Charlotte's question is, what are some of the resources or suggestions for dealing with political race? Our country is falling apart stress while we're kind of stuck at home alone to fret. Well, I'll say, fortunately, there are groups that are still meeting, even though it's online, it's not the same uh, as being able to um, meet up in person, but there's the Des Moines, I'm not, Great with acronyms. Uh, showing up for racial justice. So Surge uh, is, is a fabulous resource uh, that you have locally here in Des Moines. Um, there are, I mean, there's still and always will be for a while the NAACP. Uh, there, there's still um, resources like One Iowa. So the large, the state's largest LGBTQ advocacy group. Uh, Iowa Safe Schools, you know, for children, what resources that we have there. So, you know, in thinking about um, the, the current political climate, it is really easy to get down, especially after looking at that last debate. <clears throat> I knew how to debate uh, by watching Sesame Street, okay? That was not the way. <laughs> it's not a read, it's a word. So for me, it, it's... <laughs> I have a sense of humor anyway. I, I laugh when things aren't funny. But I guess for me, uh, it's one of my defensive coping mechanisms. I will always find a silver lining. Uh, but for me, yeah, Liz, fabulous. The United Way Equity Challenge. You know, uh, the Iowa Department of Public Health has several bureaus that are, you know, trying to adapt that for our system. Uh, but there are resources around where you can challenge yourself and, and, and challenge your teams to uh, really think about what health equity means, you know, in our line of work. So when thinking about mental health, um, it's easy to get trapped up in some of the policies and, and national landscape that's happening, but bringing it back to your area and your locus of control uh, of what you can do, bringing it into your work and bringing it into your particular job role, I think is critical. And thinking about how you're able to uh, speak with others and be able to have the, the dialogue. So Lauren, I really like the point that you made. All the panelists made great points, but I really resonated with being able to have the dialogue, you know, when folks just don't agree. Uh, and, and right now we're, we're seeing the fallout uh, with folks who are supposed to be leading us in, in dialoguing, but it turns out we might have to show them better than we could tell them as far as what dialogue, sustained dialogue actually means. Um, so think about your local 
uh, showing up for racial justice, uh, resources like Liz is sharing on uh, racial equity challenges through United Way, uh, practicing good dialogue behaviors and being able to step away and, you know, walk out in nature if you can. Jamie, uh, we, if you, if somebody can put the slides back, one of the slides uh, is about some other more resources through Broadlands and through Polk County Health, uh, which might help uh, to know uh, where, where, uh, yeah, so if you want to go yourself, Jamie, feel free, but uh, yeah, so there are, uh, depending on, this was not direct question, but uh, depending on the need, there are quite many 24-hour-7 uh, uh, numbers available. So the one of the numbers put here is the crisis center, uh, which is uh, 282-5752. Uh, and that, that with the Polk County Health also. Lauren, were you going to respond? I saw you. Uh, I, had, I had a snarky comment and then a real comment. <laughs> My snarky comment was just to, to piggyback off of uh, what Destiny was saying. Um, I would say the place to have conversations, real crucial conversations, is not social media in the comment section. That's my snarky comment. Um, <laughs> few things are productive in, in that region. Um, I just needed to say that. Um, also, I would say that uh, also realize that you have the option to take a step back. And maybe that is not always uh, seen as being productive, but protecting your mental space, particularly now, after you've done the actionable items, uh, because that, that really is where I am right now, is what can I do? What's going to make me feel good to move whatever particular topic forward? Um, writing postcards, for example, politically is one of them. Um, donating money to to resources um, is another. Then, t then saying it's okay for me not to engage today, and if that's for a couple hours or for a couple of minutes, because it it is overwhelming and uh, news cycles and our phones and people talking. Uh, I I have found that shutting it down uh, for fifteen minutes can make a difference in how I'm feeling about uh, my day, about life, about um, is the world doomed? Are we are we done? Uh, the doom and gloom can can be all consuming. So um, I just want to give you permission, if no one has, to say it is okay to take a step back. And I would um, just emphasize self care, um, which is not it's it's more than you know a bubble bath and lighting a candle, although those are good too. Um, self care is critically important. And, um, you know, I think the more we take hold of the comments that have already been made about how do we get ourselves out of our downstairs brain into our upstairs brain and let go of some of the things we can't control, uh, also part of self-care. So um, I just kind of reiterate that, you know, taking care of you first is critically important, whatever that looks like for you. Yeah, all very good, uh, you know, reminders, I think, for all of us as we do look at you know everything that's around us so social media i think that's a great one there's a new on netflix on social dilemma that um i have not watched but i've heard lots of great things that it might make us all remind ourselves that get stepping away from the facebook and the twitter and the instagram and the TikTok and whatever else is out there these days that is probably not a bad thing for all of us to do. So I'm gonna just wrap up with um, some of the additional resources. Dr. Shaw mentioned the ones from uh, Broadlines. Uh, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness has a number of great resources, support groups and other trainings available that we would encourage you to check out. Uh, the Children and Families of Iowa, Iowa ACES, uh, Your Life Iowa was also mentioned uh, by Liz as a great resource. And then Make It Okay um, also has a number of resources as we work to reduce the stigma around mental illness. So lots of great resources that are available. So hopefully you'll take advantage and um, use those. And Dr. Shaw talked about um, all of these different additional resources um, here locally as well. Um, so I'm excited to share that we've had such great success with um, the webinar series for the last six weeks that actually in 2021, the wellness capital is looking at putting together a monthly webinar series on just wellness in general. So that will include not only mental health, but a whole slew of 
topics that really reinforce the importance of our holistic health. So that mental, physical, social, and emotional well-being. And so we look forward to having you join, in us, join us for that. I also would encourage you, if you're interested in learning more about Make It Okay and becoming an ambassador of Make It Okay, we have trainings coming up that are all virtual that anyone can attend and participate in. And so we'll make sure that you have access to those so you can register and help us continue to have those open conversation and compassionate conversations so that we can help each and other, uh, each, each of us as we work through what this pandemic is doing for our overall health and especially our mental health. So I wanna do a big shout out to all of our panelists today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to come and speak with all of us, share your knowledge, your insights and your personal experiences. Um, it's greatly appreciated and we uh, appreciate the support of helping us make it okay. Um, here in central Iowa. So wish everyone a wonderful day and stay well.